Grace and peace to you from God our Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. It's a great day in the kingdom. You're here in worship. You began your week by seeking God's will and God's way. And so I want to tell you, if you're a guest with us today, we don't do visitors. Guests are with whom and of whom we praise God are here in the church of Jesus Christ, worshiping in the edifice, being with the church. And so no matter how your week goes, I want you to remember that's where you started And you need to be encouraged by that. You need to remind yourself of that. So if you're a guest with us today too, you need to be warned. We do the Pauline greeting. And the Pauline greeting is simply this. Peace be with you. And the response is? Let's stand and greet each other in Christ's name. This is All Saints Sunday, and we're gathering with people around the world who've come to their places of worship to remember the saints that have gone before them, and we're doing that here today. Not only the saints of, of this church, but saints across the world, people that you know and love uh, uh, across the world who have gone before us and led the way and held the light high. So we remember on this sacred day, these saints in our congregation that we have lost this year. Robert Bob Crumby. Lou Ann Doss. John Bob Ellis. Mary Mock. Penny Pelfrey, Jody Young, and we also take time to lift those known to us that have gone on before us. He remain in our hearts, and I hope you will carefully and prayerfully look through the insert in your bulletin throughout the rest of this day to remember those. Let us pray. Oh God, there are so many who, go be, who have gone before us. Their faces appear in our hearts and our minds even at this moment. People who have loved us. People who set the example. And all of us are here because someone, someone inv- invited us into faith and into the church some who invited us into this church. And for those saints, we are so grateful. Just as you walked ahead of each of them, prepared the way and opening, opening the doors of heaven to all of them, you do the same for us this day and every day. And so on this sacred day, we remember those who have gone before, who gave us this church who gave us this sacred place we give you thanks hear these and all our prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us all to pray saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is for all the saints. Let's sing it out.
all of us bring prayer concerns into this hour of worship. Uh, We think of those who are not in the room right now, but would like to be, and we love them and pray for them. I want to remind you that the job of praying is more than just words uh, in the sanctuary on Sunday. It's your voice, your phone call, your card, your visit. You are the arms and feet and hands and voice and heart, uh, not only of the pastor, but of the church as you reach out to those who are, who is, who are hurting. Susan Wolf's mother, she lost her mother yesterday. We remember her. Also, uh, <coughs> Janice Cold's uh, sister, Nancy Moore, they were unable to put that name in the, in the All Saints Bulletin. And uh, Jan, uh, and Jan Tonroy's uh, brother-in-law, Steve, uh, we did their ser- the service was held here yesterday. <coughs> Remembering these and all, all of our concerns this morning, let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh God, it's in quiet moments like this we will realize that this is where we need to be. This is where we come with the intimate secrets that no one knows but us and you. It's where we come with our burdens, the broken places in our own lives, the broken people that we love and we care deeply for. We bring them to this room We know we can pray anywhere and you hear us, but something about being together as a family and sharing the concerns of our hearts at the deepest places helps us to be lifted because we know there are others who are praying as well. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our pastor and the way he leads us so courageously. Thank you for the love that you've given each of us so that we might go out and be your presence in the world. It's not a perfect world this morning. Never has been and never will be. But yet we know you are a God whose hand and heart are in all places at all times. There are bombs, guns going off even now as we are here in this quiet, peaceful place. We pray that somehow seeds of peace will be sown in the Middle East and other places around the globe where there's tension and hunger and heartache. Help us to be instruments of your peace in our own world that that peace may radiate radiate out beyond the walls of this sanctuary. Help us to be your church in the days that are ahead. Thank you for your presence. Inspire us with your word. Make us a new people as we receive the symbols of your body and blood that we might go out to be your presence, your body in the world. All these things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As the ushers come forward, will you prepare your hearts to receive the morning offering? Let us pray. Oh God, you have blessed us with so much. You are so generous. And we in turn now want to give not only from our resources, but from our hearts, help us to give ourselves to those in need. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, uh-huh. 
from the New Testament, uh, Matthew verses uh, 1 through 12 of chapter 5, commonly referred to as the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. If you would, would you stand with me in honor of our scripture, please? When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know if y'all could see over here, but I had two boys in a four-point stance during the prayer right here. It's all about winning. I'm glad our kids are comfortable enough to be who they are, even during the children's sermon. I've failed to mention this, but I'm going to say this directly. If you have another Sunday school class, I'm starting a class in the gathering room, and you have another Sunday school family, you're not invited. Stay with your family. Love them, support them, they need you. But if you don't have a current Sunday school, we're studying Albert Outler's quadrilateral in the scripture validation within the fallibility of human precept and the reality of healthy tradition in modern day context. All that means is that we're studying the scripture and using our minds, not what some jit told us years ago. And that's very important. That's how it works. That's why we have women and we don't go, we let our women speak. We don't have to do that. We haven't done it 
for years and years and years. Those are important things in Scripture that have at times been used, abused, and actually distorted out of theological ignorance on behalf of clergy. And so we're going to be careful as we study the Scripture, but we're beginning in Genesis. We're going to talk about the Genesis story, and we'll take it from there. And we'll also study the nature of the three main types of grace. So if that interests you and you don't have a current Sunday school class, come on into the gathering room, and we'd love to have you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in spite of the nature of the presenter, we pray that your will is done in the words that are spoken this very day. Guide us, direct us. And through the Holy Spirit, Lord, may we be led into your will and your way. And that all is preached, prayed, said, and sung be to that honor and glory. And in the name of the risen Christ Jesus, all of God's church said, Doc Johnson practiced dentistry in a small town for over 50 years. And on his deathbed, he went to his family and he said, I have gold teeth, as you know, and you've wondered where I've placed them, but I have them in a safety deposit box at the bank. And upon my death, I want you to take those teeth. And I want you to have the gold melted down from all those teeth. I want it to go to charity. Doc Johnson was known to have not pulled the tooth if it didn't need to be extracted in any way. And he was known to offer people, if the tooth was corroded, to buy the tooth from them for the amount of gold that was in the tooth. And so upon his death, the teeth were gathered from the bank. And as they opened them, they found hundreds of teeth with just a little bit of gold. And after refining with high heat, those rotten teeth yield to charity $4,000. God's gold rotting on the earth from nothing to something. From the degradation, the deterioration of that which is our human bodies to taking something about it and making it valuable, useful, and kingdom building. And that's the way God sees us. The Beatitudes, nine blesseds, starting out in Aramaic and then transferring throughout the tribes, going to Greek and then Latin and then English and then a couple more translations in between. Yet the word blessed is to be blessed. And that is to say the prefix in Greek is that you're already blessed. We just don't describe it very well in the English vernacular at all. There are so many words in Greek at times we do not examine in Scripture that it's a little bit cheated at times. Remember Adam and Eve? What you and I learned growing up was this. It was implied. Adam went to work, you know, because Eve was home. We talked about this in Sunday school for a little bit. Did you picture Adam standing with Eve when she ate the apple? Of course, it wasn't an apple. It was that was from Da Vinci. It was just a forbidden fruit. It's in a painting, and we rename the narrative. It doesn't matter. It could be an apple or a pomegranate, pear, whatever you want to call it. Anything that came from the tree that was forbidden, she consumed. But what was sold to us for years was this. Adam wasn't present, and we know when we pay attention to the story of creation, Adam was silently present, and present silently. And instead of encouraging Eve into God's will, he just stood there. And later on we know, when God came looking for them in the Garden of Eden, what did Adam say? That chick right there you gave me, she did it. She, I, I mean, I, she fed it to me. And because they're innocent, they didn't even know God was watching. Why would we be talking about the Beatitudes of all Sundays, all Saints Sunday? I'll tell you now, because God is watching. I think about Charlie every year from now on. Every All Saints. Grumpy, crotchety, 
wore a jean jacket in August, wasn't grateful, never said thank you, thanks for lunch, Joel, never. Hated Ford, didn't like riding in Ford, told me Ford was bad. Hated the way I drove on the roads. I've told you this before, Charlie would be like, you think you could hit more bumps? And on the way to Mary Martin Elementary, I would kill it. I'd be like, you like that? And every time Charlie would go, bam, quit it. We did the same thing every week for five hours. Now I'll clean up Charlie's language because Charlie cussed. Charlie did. God's watching. I did too. Now, I can say all that about Charlie, but you know what Charlie also was? He was a disciple of Jesus Christ that would literally run in his walker to meet people when they came in that door. And many of you met him in his jean jacket, pushing a walker to see who you were and to make sure you were welcomed. And Charlie sat every day on Wednesdays watching the children in what is now the Charlie McLean Children's Activity Center. And he watched. And those little ones knew that he cared that they were there. And Charlie is now today among the saints. Will you say amen? We grieve when we grieve those whom we've lost because those whom we've lost were a blessing to us. And because that blessing has been temporarily removed, we're sad, yet we need to remember we're a blessing in someone else's life. Someone else has been inspired by what we've done, what we've said. Years ago, I had that confirmation class, and they were heck on wheels. And they were vocal to the church, and they wanted to tell the adults about all the things they weren't doing. Like they had all these questions. Why doesn't our church do this? Why doesn't our church do that? And sometimes I didn't have a very good answer. Because you know when you're 12, you don't really have that. You haven't learned agenda that well. It's an immediate agenda. But when you start getting a little depth theologically, well, why doesn't our church do this? Why don't we do that? And one little boy goes, well, what do you think about inviting people to church? And I said, well, we're to invite the whole world. And he goes, we are. Now, here's an interesting thing. 20-something years ago, Pastor Kent sat on a board, and this is what I said to the board. You're going to remember this. He said, you have a passion about evangelism. I said, I do. And Kent was about with five other people. We were in Weatherford. I was irritated because I found my uh, folder. To give you how encouraging things were at the time for people to go into ministry, the manager of Jack in the Box called me after I'd spent over 40 hours of my time working on paperwork for a folder in order to apply conditionally to be a candidate for ministry in the Methodist Church because the folder was found in the dumpster of the Jack in the Box in Weatherford. Because you know when you're called to ministry, everybody yells, yippee, yahoo, thank God you came. Somebody wasn't very excited. And they had found my folder and had been run over by a car tire. <laughs> and these guys were interviewing me and I said, if we mean it, as pastors we'll go door to door or we don't mean it. If we mean it, we'll do it. If we don't, we won't. And I remember that's not what you want to say to some veteran Methodist pastors. And Kent didn't even know I was going to share this today, but Kent goes, well, I'll tell you what I think. I think it's great. Now, you talk about upsetting the apple cart. I mean, you talk about offending pastors. After church, I'll tell you what my term and my best friend Brad's term is. He, Nolan Ryan's in his church at Round Rock. And... Brad said this to Nolan Ryan. Hey, we both worked for the Rangers at the same time. And Nolan Ryan goes, you did? He goes, yeah, we did. Nolan goes, when, when were you with them? He goes, well, it was, you know, back in the 90s. I parked cars and 
you were throwing strikes at the plate. And Brad and I talked about a term that we use that I can't use in God's church, but it has to do with acting like you're bigger time than you're not, acting like you're too sophisticated to pray with someone, acting like you don't want to look like an evangelical because God forbid, acting like religion is a private thing of which nothing in scripture says it is. Matthew 28 says, go out into the world and make disciples of all nations, not just your area, everywhere. And part of you is inspired today to come to worship and be involved in church is because someone helped you have a greater understanding of the nine forms of being blessed. And they walked before you. And they will pass and see the face of God before you. And then there'll be a day when your name will be read and the bell will be rung in memory of you. And your children and your grandchildren's children will receive the heritage of the gospel of Jesus Christ because what you did and you're related to the God of Abraham and Isaac and who you are and how you are because of who you've influenced. And folks, that's what this is truly about. Will you say amen? Because here's the thing, Daniel, Elijah, Jeremiah, didn't work out real great for them. They were persecuted, they were prosecuted for doing God's will. I remember thinking that day when they found my folder in the Jack in the Box dumpster in Weatherford, God, are you trying to tell me not to do this? And then after the interview with Kent and his committee, that paperwork was lost and I was accused of not even sitting in on that interview with you and because they believed in your integrity so much they made me personally call the people to call the conference office and verify that they had interviewed me essentially you could be lying and I think of a Methodist preacher that looked at me and he goes Son, do you want to be, you want to be made uh, into the person that has the easy life or you want to live a real life? Who says the world's supposed to lay down for you to be called to ministry? You either want it and you're called or you don't. It's one way or another. I don't care about losing your folder. I don't care that the fact they lost your paperwork. Who cares? Toughen up. He was right. That man has gone on to be with the saints. And that chewing out I got that day was the best thing that ever happened to me. You mean it? Toughen up. You mean Jesus Christ? Reach out. Yesterday was Bible retreat, and the kids ran around here like banshees. Every book of Scripture was underneath a pew, in the choir loft, sorry choir, I know the chairs are a little messed up. But you'll be alright, toughen up. Right? Under the, under the chairs here. Behind the drum set in the corner. And they found every one of the books. And they ran back and forth to the sanctuary and dumped the books out on the floor. And it was the funnest thing in the world to watch them. We talked about... How God loved in the Old Testament. And by the way, please don't ever say it again about the mean God of the Old Testament. The mean God of the Old Testament showed more grace than the 27 books of the New Testament, even with the Savior. Because look at what happened time and time again. And God says, well, I'm still here. I freed you from slavery. I'm still here. All Saints Sunday is about that. Sometimes it's those people that gave us tough love. Sometimes it's about those people that were in our lives and we didn't realize how much they influenced us until they were changed and they left this earth. You know, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians had some Romans decide that they would play with them a little bit. And I love that because Paul did what we call the rope-a-dope thing. For some of you that remember the 70s, there was a boxer, Muhammad Ali, and he would just act like he just couldn't go anymore. And he would put his arms up and he would lay on the ropes and 
they would just pound him and pound him away. And he had a way of contorting his body where they couldn't get to his ribs and they couldn't get to his head. And he would wait until they were completely worn out. And then you would see his face look up and he would smile. And when they were breathing, could barely survive, he would finish them off. Now think about the prophets as they celebrated their deaths while they were dying going, God won this one. And so did I. I'm leaving this earth to go to the kingdom of heaven. You see, we are those teeth that are rotting as we walk this earth. Years ago, I decided that I would put on my marine dress blues. I had worked out for three years. Because we know that the shape of your body at 24 is the same shape of your body at 45. And I got all confident, and I looked at Christy, and those dress blues had been hanging in that closet, and I didn't like the army dress blues because I thought they made you look like a bus driver. I just did. They had a black tie and a white shirt, and I was like, am I flying a plane or driving a bus, or am I in military, but didn't like them. Now, no Marine will ever like going from dress blues to army dress blues. I just need to say that. God bless everyone for serving, but it's just not the same. And I remember I walked over with great confidence. And what they did was they literally form-fitted that uniform to you. You would go in and you're wearing your boxers and you stand there. And these ladies would just get all the tape measurements perfectly formed to your body. And I started to put on that coat. Number one, the idea that I could possibly, without strangulation, button the tab collar was never going to happen. And then the second thing was more humiliation in an exercise because you remember the colonial vest that they wore at the beginning of the colonies? It was blue and the buttons came down like this. As I got to the second button and exhaled, I realized I would look like nothing but a colonial officer in a blue uniform with the buttons flailed out because right here was just a little bit more bulbous. I remember being utterly humiliated. And I think about all the people that have gone before me that have grown on this earth and aged. I remember making fun of my father for getting gray hair. And then God went, you know what? Your beard's going to turn gray first, Joker. And it did. But I remember all the people that have gone before and encouraged me. My father told this story, and I didn't hear it till my grandfather's funeral, but he said, we didn't have much money growing up, and Daddy pumped gas. And I remember when I was a little, little boy, he said, we didn't have this hand cleaner, and he said, Daddy cleaned his hands with gasoline after working in the station all week. And when he came in, he had on the nicest suit he could buy, but when he ushered, he would smell like gasoline, and his hands were still a little bit greasy, you could tell he was a laborer. And he said, but he would have me sit on usher's row as a little boy. And I would watch them usher and he was teaching me I needed to do more. Not just be at a church, but find a way to be involved in a church. And then he recalled another woman in his life. And he said, we called her Sweaty Betty. He said, Miss Betty was always sweaty. And he said, we even had a limerick. Sweaty Betty is always sweaty because her name is Betty and she's sweaty. And he said, Miss Betty had a dirty dress on every Sunday. Miss Betty's makeup was smeared and run every Sunday. He said, and one day I went to a men's breakfast when I was in junior high school. And he said, Miss Betty taught middle school Sunday school, grades 5 and 6, for over 40 years. And he said, I saw why Miss Betty was sweaty. Miss Betty had had polio and couldn't walk. And she would hide her crutches in the closet. And she would crawl up the stairs, three flights, to teach us ungrateful children about the love of Jesus Christ. 
He said, I got a devotional guide when I went to youth. And he said, that completely changed my view of Miss Betty. The runny makeup, the dirty dress, who was literally to crawl upstairs to teach me about how much Jesus loved me. And he said, when I graduated, all the Sunday school teachers that were left wrote in our devotional guide. He said, and back then it was a pamphlet. And he said, I'll never forget. She said, sin will keep you away from this book or this book will keep you away from sin, Thomas Q. And then signed, Sweaty Betty. In Christ's love. Can you imagine crawling up three flights of stairs? Putting on your makeup, doing your hair. Coming into the church so early that nobody sees you. Hiding your crutches in a closet and crawling up a staircase because you knew the love of God. To teach children about Jesus Christ. The volunteers yesterday. Somebody's going to look up and remember Kim Brown. And they're going to remember Miss Teresa. And they're going to remember Doris Clark. And they're going to remember parents that brought them to Bible retreat and vacation Bible school and Sunday school and helped them learn about Christ their Savior who loves them. And those people's name will be read and a bell will be rung and they will not be poor in spirit. They will inherit the kingdom of heaven and the bell will ring and their name will be called. Your name will be called and a bell will be rung and Jesus will extend his hand to you in love and say come to the kingdom that's where we're headed church and you need to remember that in the times of the loss and the sorrow just as you have been blessed we are obligated we are ordered to pass that blessing on in the love of God through Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, will you say amen? We share a union, and we do that for a Savior that was not only unappreciated, but we got weak when he began to be persecuted. And so... I invite you, after we describe the meal that is about to occur, as Christ is your Savior, there is nothing Methodist about this table. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Christ is buried in obedience to the confession and pardon. We join together now in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. In just a few moments, you'll be invited forward to receive the sacrament. I want to invite those who are assisting in the serving of communion to come, come forward first. Jesus gathered in the upper room with some of his closest and dearest friends. They had been in ministry together for three years. And now they were to go out from that place. And they didn't know what the next day or the next days would bring. But as a symbol of his love, and as a, a way of helping them to understand what was about to take place, he said these sacred words, and we repeat, repeat them every time we gather for communion. He took a loaf of bread and broke it and said, 
Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Remember, forever and ever and ever, whatever you've done wrong in your, pa- in your past can be forgiven and forgotten. You can start all over again. A clean slate, a new start. That's what the symbol of Jesus' body and blood stands for. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. The body and blood of Christ offered for you. When we receive it into our bodies, we receive the presence of Christ so that we may go out and be the presence of Christ in the world. Just a moment, you'll be invited to come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're not so worthy as to gather up the crumbs underneath your table, but yet you always love and forgive us. And grant, Lord, we now and hereafter serve you in newness of life and evermore dwell in Christ and he in us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, all of God's church said, I need to, before the invitation make a quick announcement we're going back to Perryton in December and so the sign up sheet is out in the foyer I can't think of the date offhand but it's in the 11th through the 14th of December if you can make one day it will make a difference I know Shannon Reynolds and I are going we can go for two days but if you can make one out of the four days it will make a difference in the lives of those in Perryton Texas and so we're asking that you you do so and consider the possibility of helping out that everyone can pray over that trip. Will you say amen? When we give the invitation every time we meet. If you'd like to accept Christ as your Savior, you'd like to be baptized, or you'd like to join with this congregation, you won't find a better group of people who are sinners just trying to get it. We would celebrate that with you. We have two upcoming baptisms I'm going to do them privately, and then you're going to bless those two young men. So if you, somebody says, hey, the Methodists are going crazy, I drove by during the week, and the dunk tank was going, that's us. Amen, church? We don't need to be conventional, we just need to be here. Let me tell you what you've done today. You've begun this week. You've begun the week in church. So as you go out from this place, realize that there are lots of folks out there standing on tiptoe, wondering if what happened in here is going to make any difference to them out there. We go from this place to carry the love, the grace, the forgiveness, the symbol of the body and blood of Christ out into the world. Let us pray. Oh God, empower us, walk ahead of us. Thank you for the saints who who stood tall, and because they did, we can as well. Thank you for this church. And the difference it makes in this community. May we make a difference for you this day and all the days ahead. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.